to you from the all-new Live House in Hollywood, California. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. Our guest is a prodigious talent. You know his work on his sister's records, who is the one, the only Billie Eilish, but you don't know how much stuff he's got going. You're going to learn. It's pretty impressive. But first, we've got this week's winner of the Axio sweepstakes. It is the one, the only Manuel Scavamusi. Congratulations. And all of you have one more week to win. It's very simple. Enter at ikmultimedia.com forward slash Pensado and add this great tool to your toolbox. So enter right now. One more week to win. Uh, Dave and I just got back from NAM and want to thank the incredible Luke Laird, Beth Laird, and Ross Copperman. We had a great talk. We're going to bring that to you as an episode very shortly. But this Saturday, which is July 27th at noon, we'll be at Imstafesta in Atlanta. It's being held at the SAE campus. We'll have a fun keynote discussion. We're going to talk about your craft, ways for you to win, and tools you can use to achieve that goal. We've got a bunch of goodies to give away, and we want to thank companies like Antares, FabFilter, PreSonus, Nugen, Melodyne, FL Studio, IK Multimedia, and a bunch of others. Don't miss. It's free. Come on out. We want to shake your hand, take a snap, and all that stuff. We've also been telling you about our guy Richard Furch and his master class. Put that on your radar. The six-time Grammy-winning engineer has worked with Prince and Frank Ocean and Macy Gray and a whole bunch of others. The combined work equals over a billion views on YouTube, which is pretty impressive. Richard put together three hours, 10 chapters, and five bonus videos of beautifully shot content. Uh, it features Asian megastar Jim and her monster hit, Light Years Away. He goes from first files to final mix. It has Chinese subtitles full of tips and techniques and philosophies you can use on any record you may do. It's fun and easy and great for any producers, engineers, or mixers. And it's pretty simple to get a hold of. So just go to emixing.com, use the code Pensado for a special treat, and we'll hook you up. Uh, as always, we want to make you a part of this big old family. If you would, sign up to our newsletter, like, subscribe, and click notify right here. And as always, we thank you so much for that. And now it's our pleasure to introduce you to what we think is one of the freshest and most gifted producer-songwriters we've heard in a long, long time. His acclaimed work with his sister, Billie Eilish, is, is just on fire. But boy, there's a lot more under the banner. Please welcome to the place, Phineas. Hey, bro. Good to see you, man. Thank you, guys. Uh, it's exciting for us. It, it, it is so much to unpack um, because there's, from harmony to arrangement to minimalism to your lyrics, obviously, your vocal approach, it is really a compelling package. As I said to you earlier off, off camera, you're hard to research because as I was listening to the music, I began listening as a fan. Uh, then I had to put on headphones. Yeah, and then you're, how old are you, 21? 21. You're 21 years old. Um, Barely. Where where did this style come from? Is it just, is it just you as instinctive? Um, well, first of all, thank you guys so much for having me. This is so exciting to be here. I've, yeah. I've been a, a viewer for a long time. And, uh, you know, learned so much stuff from all of your content and videos and interviews. Oh, great. And I, still, I still like to watch videos of people that I actually know in my personal life on here because I learn, I, I, you know, questions get asked that I don't ever think to ask them. It's great to find out more about people. And, Same thing happens to us. We, um, we learn all the time. From it's great. Too. People yeah. that you already know. Yeah. It's awesome. Um, so as far as like any sort of specific style that I have or that mm -hmm. has developed, um, I think if I go back the, the short amount of time that I've been producing any music at all, even just trying to learn how to use something, you know, the first several years of, I think probably almost everyone's um, career in music are, are largely derivative. Mm -hmm. They're like, for me, it was any artist that I was listening to and ingesting, which mm -hmm. at the start was like maybe Green Day or My Chemical Romance right. and then John Mayer right. and then you know, like once I got into like hip hop, it was like the first Childish Gambino record, which mm -hmm. was produced by Ludwig. And I, like, I look at Ludwig's production in a sort of a similar sense to mine. And I hope he doesn't mind 
me saying this. I've never met him. But I always looked at him as like a... Because he did like TV scoring and film scoring. Mm -hmm. And then he started working with Donald because I think he did the score of Community, the mm -hmm. show that Donald was right. on. Yep. And uh, to my knowledge, you know, Donald was like, yeah, I'm, I was doing an album. Mm -hmm. And he just sort of said, okay. And it's like, it's kind of evident when you listen to the first Childish album, Camp, that it, it's like a producer making hip hop that has like no business making hip hop. Mm -hmm. But that's what that's I what like. Cool. That's what I like about it. It's too weird mm -hmm. and great. Mm -hmm. And so that that's what makes it unique. And I feel like that's what's always made his Ludwig's production so unique. And that's always like how I've like tried to think about it is like that I'm not like a, a guy that's like has a background in a thing, but I'll try to do that thing and synthesize mm -hmm. it and maybe it'll get interesting. I remember very vividly like the first day I did like a like a thing with trap hi hats. Mm -hmm. And it was like putting on like your older brother's coat <laughs> that you don't like feel entitled to what you're right. like. Yeah, well, this pretend, I'll, let's pretend this is mine. <laughs> mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, but then you just do it and get comfortable with it. It's mm -hmm. like language or anything, get fluent. And I think that's probably, I know when we talked about it, what's so interesting is that there's this oral landscape that, you know, part of what you choose is cinematic and right. there's this minimalist kind of quality to it. Yeah. Your lyrics just paint word pictures that you absolutely can feel, man. I mean, it's like, Thanks, oh man. yeah, I've experienced this. And then as you bounce around from track to track, it sort of doesn't let you go. Oh, thanks. And, um, That's such a compliment. And, yeah, and, I, and I don't mean to gush, it's just so fresh thanks, man. that, you know, we're always telling people to push the envelope and try different things and you seem to be sort of fearless in that regard. It has to be interesting to you for you to do it. Is that fair? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I'm I'm trying to excite myself, and then mm -hmm. as far as whatever sort of sound people would claim is my sound, like to me, I'm listening to so much music all the time that it's it's very rare for me to do something that I I really don't think is like something that someone else is also doing. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Not that it's like a rip off of a certain thing, but like. Usually when someone listens to my thing and goes, I've never heard that before. I go like, well, you haven't heard this song that I really like. <laughs> you just haven't you found know? the source, yeah. Um, but uh, I, I will say that it's hugely important to me to to do things that, I, that do sound different to me, that sound unique, because it's like one of the few things that I feel is like really, truly quantifiable. I don't know when a song is a hit or not. I don't know when it's timeless. I don't know when it's fresh, but I do know when it doesn't sound like something else. Right. And I feel like one of the funny things that I've found in my experience with a &Rs is that they hear things that do sound like other hits mm. and they think it sounds like a hit. Mm -hmm. And I go like, no, it sounds like that hit. Like right. it doesn't sound like its own thing. thing. In, my, in my limited years of experience, the mm. things that actually are like really make waves are the things that just don't sound like other things. Absolutely. When Absolutely. you start a song, how do you start? Do you start from uh, an idea, like um, an idea? And do you start with a drum beat? Do you start with a lyric? Well, I think all... A and B, part A and B. Yes. With uh, the Slightly's uh -huh. and with uh, Billy. Um, well, to, to answer the, the B part of that question, because it's a fast answer, the Slightly's was this band that I played in in high school, and mm -hmm. we stopped playing together a couple years ago. Oh, so that's too bad. <laughs> Well, I like some of the stuff on Spotify. Thanks, man. Um, so yeah, the music that I've put out under my own name, um, if we're looking at it as sort of like three different parts of a pie chart, if it's like music under my own name, music under Billy's name, and then music under any other artist's name. Mm -hmm. um, to me, the, the most effective way is just always a way that's inspiring and leads to a different thing. I think definitely like the most common way in my, my lifespan of, of songwriting has been at an instrument and kind of that like like faking a song into existence, playing a chord, mm -hmm. singing something, being phonetic with your vocal, letting a word come out, being inspired by that, that kind of all like, as it sort of shapes all at once. Is, um, this, is this usually on a piano or a guitar? Or? Both, yeah, both of those. And then beyond that, um, it's always really inspiring to do anything that is a different approach to that. So making a beat that, especially for like really rhythmic lyrics, it's really inspiring to have a great rhythm under it. Other, other than Billy, do you collaborate much? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I learn so much from from any collaboration and I, I try to do that. You know, the the thing about, you know, it's rare in today's world for pop albums 
if we're calling Billy's album a pop album, which mm -hmm. I'm happy to do. Well, to somebody be, called it pop trap. But pop we'll trap, there, yeah, yeah, alt trap, whatever in, it is. In the new goth or something. New, I like new goth. That's <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Um, it's very rare for albums um, of that type to be made by like two people. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're usually group endeavors and yeah. we've, we pride ourselves on, on making them as, as a small a unit as possible. So it, it does take up most of my creative time. Um, okay. But right now, uh, I, try to, I try to have my manager schedule me like one session with another artist, either a friend of mine or a new artist a week. Mm -hmm. And then even if the session is for naught, I learn something at the mm -hmm. session. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, it's been really fascinating over the last couple of years to find out just how everybody works so differently from each other. There's like no, there's no real common thread. Everybody's Absolutely. like so different, so fast. Are you contributing to the lyrics much uh, with Billy? With Billy, yeah. I mean, we are, we're writing all those songs, you know, in tandem in a real kind of, you know, sort of traditionally collaborative okay. way. Um, I'm playing more of the instrumental music, mm -hmm. although she does play some piano and some guitar and some ukulele. I'm playing a larger percentage ukulele. of it. Yeah, she plays ukulele mm -hmm. quite well. And then um, lyrically, it's How probably... If she plays well. <laughs> Don't tell her I said that. <laughs> when I compare her to Eddie Vedder, they, oh, okay. both, sound, they yeah. both sound good. It's like so. Eddie. You know? Yeah, Eddie's killing it. She's like <laughs> on her way. She's right there. Yeah. She wrote something on a ukulele. Yeah, there's a song on the album called Eight that she wrote like 75% of. We get pretty specific with our splits. I think she has 70. Really? I think she has 75% of the song. Do you do 50 50? No, we do, we do a lot of the time, but uh, I don't, I think it's McCartney and Lennon did 50 50. And they always just bite, they chomp at the bit with that one. They're always <laughs> like, every Lennon interview I've ever heard is like some song that Paul sung and he's like, another song I should have sung. It's all yeah. like, it's so it's all yeah, yeah, so we've always been really careful about that. And there's some songs on Billy's records that I wrote alone and we don't, mm -hmm. we make no bones about that. Mm -hmm. There's a song called When the Party's Over that's, yeah. that was just me and, you know, I think, I think it's a Ocean weird... Ocean Eyes was all you. Ocean Eyes was me too. Mm. I think we're in a weird place with like writing sessions where, where artists and just people in the room like eating some chips and wearing a baseball hat are getting like <laughs> getting 15, 20%. Yeah. And I really like, <laughs> really don't like that. I think mm. it's dishonest. Sometimes like the first year of Billy and I having any form of like career at all, we were thrown into a lot of writing sessions and you'd, you'd get thrown into the session with somebody and they'd go, you got to meet this guy. He wrote this song that you love. Mm. And you go like, oh my God, he did? Mm. And you go in and you're like, wow, I love that. And they're like, oh yeah. I mean, I was just like in the room, like they didn't do anything. Yeah. Oh man, yeah. I hate to cut it, you know, but that graphic of, of the, the lighted, lighted match thing that you were oh, doing, yeah. you tell them about that. Um, yeah, we the did. The graphic a, just went by with the orange. Just flowed by. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I colored, I colored the, the track orange, orange and logic yeah. just, to, just to further it. But yeah, we, we did this song a couple years ago called um, Watch. And Watch was one of those songs that existed as a kind of a, a copyright on a piano, but the production of it was sort of hard to pin down. And so we went through a lot of iterations. And the thing that made us excited about it, I think a lot of the time when you do like four or five different different goes at a song, mm -hmm. you get very bored of like working on it and tracking vocals. But the thing that made us really excited was Billy and I stood in our bathroom because it had like the ceiling fan. So we mm -hmm. weren't gonna smoke out the house. Mm -hmm. And we just, I held a Tascam um, dr 5 mm -hmm. and she would like strike matches and then she'd hold it and I'd strike matches and then we'd record us like blowing them out. And we built this whole beat out of like matches being lit. And then I would, <laughs> I'd cut the the sound off with like the kick drum. So uh -huh. they, it was very rhythmic. It's, it's um, incredible. Thanks, man. It's but it's all clipped, all those sounds clipped. Yeah. Like they only sounded really good if they were in logic, all just like peaking. I don't really know why. I mean, and ultimately that sound design right yeah yeah you're right yeah, yeah. And, totally um did that come earlier in your life just the interest in sound design as you were listening to things and, and oh stuff? yeah 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 i was always like on the kind of before i knew any terminology before i had any kind of grasp of it i was always like just obsessed with like really inventive exciting use of like panning mm -hmm. um and i i remember the first video of yours i ever saw was like 10 mixing mistakes <laughs> oh, please of, no one don't of the, no it was great oh okay it was, yeah. it was a great video more, more 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 <laughs> and one of the one of the things you brought up in that video was like like don't pan for no reason you're oh, like yeah. some of these mixes just make me want to like lean my head 
Yeah. And I remember being like, oh my God, that's such a good yeah, point. Don't pan every effect left right. and right. Totally. But a great pan is a great pan. Yeah. It can be a, it can be a hook. Yeah. And I think, done right. I think the cool thing is, the cool thing is anytime you can do something production wise that people who have no interest in production still think is cool, right? Yeah. Yeah. So like to me, like Mr. Brightside by the Killers, starting with like the yeah. electric in the right, yeah. drums are like super crushed in the left, yeah. Yeah. vocals down the center, yeah. and then it drops into like the second verse and it all just goes like, the and like hits Van the Halen center. The first was all like, right. like that. Right, right. And then there's like crazy stuff. Like I grew up listening to like the monophiles of the Beatles, yeah. and I really don't like the stereo. Me too. I, the I'm stereos really, are so I weird. I couldn't afford stereo, so I had to do mono. Yeah, and so like when I listen to those remaster stereo things, where yeah. like all of the vocals are here, and the, yeah. like it's so it's so exactly what you're talking about to me. Where I'm yeah. like, this just makes me want to lean my head. Your setup. What do, what do you use? Are you still on Logic or are you live? Yeah, I use Logic. Um, I just got. You know, it got intuitive for me really fast. Mm -hmm. Great and, creative um, tool. We use we use Ableton Live to run our playback system live, okay. and we play to click. Mm -hmm. and, Are you yeah. still in the place where you where you had like a Nord over here and a real piano over here? And um, yeah, I use uh, a Nord Stage Three. Um, my rack is like really simple. It's a Nord Stage Three, which I, I right now probably then usually like I evolve and come up with new ideas oh. for the next cycle. But right now it's a Nord Stage Three, which is always a, a grand piano because it's just got such good hammer action mm -hmm. and there's so much piano in Billy's music that it's always mm -hmm. great to just have it right there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have an Akai MPK 261 on top of that that's like aggressively automated. To me, like the more stuff you can take out of um, what you're actually doing that's, that's mechanical on stage and mm -hmm. the more you can be musical. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of learned that from our drummer, Andrew Marshall, mm -hmm. who whose approach was like sort of the opposite of like... Could you have him visit me? At yeah, some Andrew. Point in time yeah, <laughs> he's great. He's so zen. But he he really likes to keep everything sort of flush and clean. Mm -hmm. When we first started touring, we didn't have any crew, really. We didn't have techs or anything. So we had a, like any computer we were using to run software like main stage for synths. I, I don't want to be mean, but... There's nothing flush and clean about your setup. <laughs> in my room? Yeah. The room is a mess. No, yeah. There's so much cables. But like it, live when we're playing shows, oh, okay. it's very clean. Okay. And, and I was the, talking about in your oh, creative in space. Yeah. Yeah. In my creative space at home, um, yeah. No, it's uh I wish it was I wish it was cleaner. It's a thing that I, I should have someone come over and dress it. Go go, go back to the live thing for a yeah. second because you do so much of it mm -hmm. and then you have such, you know. It seems simple, but there's complex sounds sure. and stuff, and so there's yeah. got to be a fair amount of programming. Like in, for instance, the drummer you were talking about. Yeah, th there's a lot of programming in, so he can have flexibility. Yeah, so a lot of when we play our shows, he has like four V drum pads, mm -hmm. and on any given Billy song, he's he's trying to play 99 to 100 percent of every percussive sound you're hearing, mm -hmm. and then. When it's appropriate, he drops into a really fat drum beat on top of it mm -hmm. that just mm -hmm. heightens the live show. Um, and on any given Billy song, there's like, you know, 15 to 20 drum samples that are added and subtracted. And so he found that the best way for him to do that was to automate through Ableton to his Roland pads all of this MIDI data where they all change all the time. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was so clean and effective because he's yeah, not having to cool. not play pads and he's also not having to have like you know, an earth, wind, and fire, like right. 60 pads. Right. He's just playing a thing and he's playing the beat and then the beat changes and he's playing the same rhythm, but where, it's a different thing. Where do you get your samples? Um, well, a lot of the sort of sound design history in, in my world is because I, that's to me like the true like definition of like a unique sound. It's like mm -hmm. if I made it. Um, Splice? So I use Splice. I've just started using Splice a little bit. I like it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of the sample libraries I've used, like I'm a, I'm a big preacher of like tweaking a sound. So mm -hmm. like if you find a great like stock kick drum mm -hmm. and you modify it and you mm -hmm. crush it a little bit and mm -hmm. you flatten it out and then you boost the like What do you, you crush it with? Um, right now I've been crushing like kick drums with like adaptive limiters that just oh. like floor it and clip it in yeah. Logic. Cool. And then um, a lot of the time I'll put like, I'll wash out a kick with like a lot of reverb and then bounce that with a lot of reverb, sort of like modern gating, and then cut the tail so it just goes like... Phoom. So it competes with all that other reverb you use. Right? So much reverb, yeah. <laughs> you need a reverb endorsement. I know. <laughs> well, I was, I was curious, because it ties into this, when you're performing as an artist, because you perform inside Billy's show, mm -hmm. in the early days, you opened up for her, right? That's right, yeah. With your love of sound and yeah. sound design and so on and so forth, 
How do you monitor? Do you like inner ear monitors or do you need stuff on the floor? Or? So I do like in-ear monitors a lot. Um, I don't think we've ever done like a full Billy show without them because mm -hmm. we're playing the click because there's so many like arpeggiators. Right. And, Things that you just want, I want to have rhythm on. Right. And we've we've always run a, she's a, a very visual artist, so Semti, like all the kind of, everything you need for, you know, to have in your head to, to be locked into like a visual behind mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. We run live. Um, but to me, even, even whatever model of Ultimate Ear that I'm on, which is advertised for its great bass response, yep, right. still not bassy enough for right. me. Mm. So I wear a sub pack live. Oh, you do? Which so you is, can feel it. Yeah, which has been really uh, fun. Because I play a lot of electric bass in the live show. And mm -hmm. I don't have a stack behind me, so mm. I just really wanted to feel it. The sub pack oh, works for you? I really like it. I, I started using it Explain totally. To the audience what that is. Yeah, sub pack um, is this... Looks like a sort of a, like a thing you might carry a baby in, like a Bjorn, and you just wear it, and it's it clips across your chest, and there's a um, a pad on the back that's like basically a subwoofer that mm -hmm. rattles, mm -hmm. and it just takes an aux in and um, responds to the low frequencies of the song, and I have it running off its own wireless pack. I kind of use it as a redundancy because you wear your wireless pack, which goes to your ears, and then I use a wireless pack for the sub, and if my pack dies, I just pull the sub pack off, and I have oh, a backup. Okay. It's kind of fun. Mm, That's cool. Mm. Very cool. What, what's uh, the vocal chain that you use on Billy? It's so disrespectful. I feel bad talking about it. I was just talking about this with my friend Ross Golan, and he was yeah. very disappointed in me. It's, you want, it's you a want compressor. To you want to whisper it to me? <laughs> no, it's a compressor. Okay. High ratio. Low threshold. You share the brand? It's Logic stock compressor. Oh, okay. And it's an, I use a Neumann TLM-103. That's a good mic. Which I really like. Um, probably at a point where it would be worth upgrading, but I have to go do a shootout and try them all. And I haven't gotten and I don't know that I'd change anything, buddy. It sounds so good. Well, here's the deal. Her voice sounds so good. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting out of the way of her voice. That's kind of the whole deal. Um, there are singers that I've worked what with. What might pre use? None. Just straight into a Apollo oh, okay. with no so plugins the one, on it. The one, the one and what about on yourself? What's your um, usually more reverb, sometimes a de-esser. The way she sings words is kind of like a natural de-esser. It's mm. pretty awesome. Mm. She just her s's are are very very hushed mm -hmm. and pretty. And when I when I listen to I lost a friend, I'm like ah, I should have de-essed that more. Mm. It's like a line in the beginning that's like ice in the summer heat yep. and all that stuff hits me and I get yeah. I get bummed out. Uh -oh. <laughs> I kind of like I kind of like s's. I, I leave more s's than most people. I definitely tell tell our yeah our. I tell my mixer Justin Herget to 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 undes things often, mm -hmm. um, and he's great, and he always does it. But um, I sometimes am like, I want more s. Mm -hmm. It's not sexy. There's, there's, there's energy and power in those in the sibilants. Yeah, and sometimes sometimes they just make you sound lispy if you de them. You just sound like that's true. You know, thong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> lyrics. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Inspire. There's a story in your head. Comes from different places. Fun. <laughs> how does the How does that process happen with with you? Um, great question. Always different. I think. I think the kind of most common thread in lyrics in my life is that I come up with something that is. I would never use the word like divine or whatever, but mm -hmm. it, but but something that takes no effort. Inspire. Some line goes like, and I have the line. Yeah. And then everything else in the song is like a jigsaw where I'm like, what fits that? Oh, that would make sense. And that's, that's where I, there's like joy for me. Gotcha. It's like coming up with a line that fits like, a, like perfectly. Mm -hmm. You can't believe mm -hmm. it would be anything else. Yeah. You, uh, you, you use the term uh, private intimacy with, with your lyrics. Yep. I, I found that fascinating. I think... I, I think don't I'll, want anybody to know anything about me. <laughs> well, I don't... My, I'm not doing a good job of that either. But my uh, my social media presence, which is pretty much everyone has a social media presence mm -hmm. at this point. I don't think if you, I think if you were just a follower of mine on an Instagram or a Twitter, mm -hmm. how old do I sound saying an Instagram or a Twitter? That sounds so like <laughs> as a he's got a Twitter. Say the Twitter, um, yeah. The uh, <laughs> I think if you're just a follower of mine, I don't think you, I don't think you know what I'm eating most days. I don't think you really know where I'm like hanging out most days. Thank you, Jesus. I'm not. Have you ever posted a picture of food? 
maybe once or twice, mostly coffee. I like coffee a lot, mm. and sometimes there's a pretty foam going on, like a wheat, <laughs> a wheat stock. Um, but uh, but you know, I think to me the place where I feel I feel it necessary to be open and vulnerable is in my music because I don't. I just would feel like I'm wasting people's time if I wasn't. And also, I think that it's the most relatable stuff. Actually, mm -hmm. I think when I said when I say stuff that is like. I'm nervous for whoever I wrote it about to hear. Actually, like most people that I'm friends with are like, oh, this line is the thing that I that sticks to me, even if it feels really personal. The stuff that feels the most unique to you, the most personal, you know, someone else is like, oh, I've felt that way. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think that 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 door that you open um, as a listener feels like something is being shared in a very special and personal way. I think. Whatever your experience is mm -hmm. in doing that, allowing yourself to do that, what makes it so genius is received that way. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. intention doesn't meet, you know, the point of view. Yours Thanks, just, man. just nails it. But That's also, nice. interestingly enough, for somebody who's 21, so many of the things that you say in so many of your songs over the last couple of years are relatable to a wide That's awesome. group of people. God knows we're older mm -hmm. than you. And I was like, <laughs> Man, listen, I, my keys have been in the sofa, and my, my wallet's in the backseat. <laughs> um, and, yeah, but he I let, kept, he left me at the airport the other day. Uh, yeah, exactly. Well, you know, your keys were in the backseat. So. <laughs> um, but that's not something that's an intention. You're just telling your, you're putting your jigsaw puzzle together from your perspective and, and letting it breathe inside. The right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, I think a lot of things to me are that Forcing almost anything is just not, yields the opposite result to me, and and that's that's always been like if I if I sat down and I was like I want to write the most relatable song, mm -hmm. I feel like I would overthink it and mm -hmm. I'd write some like mess of a song that's mm -hmm. too bland to mm -hmm. have anyone be attached to, mm -hmm. and so to me the, like the only way I can do it is like and there are song there are songs that I love I wish I could think of a name of one right now to like give but there are songs that are so specific and narrative driven that you don't relate to them at all mm -hmm. but they're still wonderful to listen to mm -hmm. and they reference you know Dave Pensado and mm -hmm. you like you know they're your friend Dave Pensado and you're like I don't that's the name of a person I can't juxtapose my significant other into that song about Dave that, Pensado I have that fit effect on people right just song, just just whole <laughs> albums triple <laughs> albums anthology you don't laugh artists Herman Herman Phoenix, but I, when, when when I just started thinking about um Old Town Road, <laughs> how intimate that was. I love that song. Me too. I, I, hate, I love it. I heard the term today. Speaking of Old Town Road, uh -huh. hick hop. Hick hop. Yeah. Hick hop. Yeah. Is the new oh oh man, thing, which was hilarious to me. Can you get me a hick, hick hop? Hick. I can't say it. Hick. I, I can't get it. Hick hop. I have a, hick I have a, hop. I have a term. Uh, a term in, in collaboration with that, which was the, today. I was at a cafe and I saw a dude with like a mullet and like a like a leather kind of. Clearly, only for fashion, like harness type thing, uh -huh. empty empty pockets for a mm. harness, mm. like Wrangler jeans on, with like one of those true religion crosses on the butt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the dude I was having you coffee with this guy. Well, he was he was very very exciting to, to watch <laughs> order his americano, and uh, and the guy I was sitting with dubbed him uh, farm punk. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> oh, he's got that kind of farm punk vibe. There's, there's a song Hick coming someplace. Farm punk. That is hilarious. When, when you go back to your songwriting, yeah. do do lyrics ever inform the music? Music inform the lyrics? Totally. The process goes both ways? Yeah, I mean, I find that in the kind of same, like, using a jigsaw as an example, like, mm -hmm. it's, for me personally, other people are incredible at it. But it's harder for me to come up with a melody I love and then fit lyrics I love just as much mm. into that melody. Other way. It's easier the other way. And the easiest is is sort of all at once. Mm. The easiest is like singing a melody that carries a, a phonetic thing and that's the thing. And then you build a rhyme. Mm. And then rhyming is its own sort mm -hmm. of ball of wax. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. like, yeah, I think like people, people use the term Swedish songwriting, which is a super generalized term. Yeah. But um, it is true that some of the Swedish writers that I've worked with are very... That just means a, an enhanced melody, right? Incredible melody, melody yeah. right? But it often is is melody f before everything. It's yeah. like a great melody, and you go like, oh my God, that is an incredible melody. And then sometimes 
fitting a lyric into like a three note melody. You're like, yeah. how am I going to use three syllables to come up with something that's like incredible? Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. but sometimes melody is all you need. You know, I love French songs. So I don't know what they're saying. <laughs> and, and also, <laughs> harmony is important to, to me. Harmony for you is, yeah. a, is a critical piece. Um, you do you do such interesting things with harmony, and then you also use instrumentation to have harmony sound oh. a different thing and, and feel different. It's That's fascinating nice. to listen to. Thanks, yeah. man. Where did where where did harmony come from? Um, probably harmony came in in my life from a, a choir that I was in mm. uh, from the age of twelve to the age of seventeen. Cogley. Yeah, no, it was an actual not a not on TV choir called. And, and to answer his question, though, the, the, yeah, talk about Glee. We'll do both. Yeah, okay. um, I was in this choir called the Los Angeles Children's Chorus mm -hmm. for whatever that is, twelve to seventeen. So, you know, five years. Mm -hmm. And uh, see how long it took me to do that math. That's why I do other <laughs> stuff. Um, and uh, you know, you sing. You sing fugues and yeah. you sing all this beautiful, you know, these hymns and these just such great choral music and, mm -hmm. and choral music that Bach arranged. It's just like all this crazy stuff. And it it was so appealing to me and so beautiful. And Billy was in the same choir for several years and harmony became really important to us. And the way that I think of like myself as like a producer is that to me, like, Sometimes I feel like you can tell when a producer is like a great guitarist, mm -hmm. or you can tell when a producer is like mm -hmm. a, a real drum drum guy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And to me, like I just am a fan of the voice. Like I I want my productions to be really vocal forward, and and everything else in the production I want to like complement whatever the mm -hmm. vocals doing. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't ever done like an a cappella record, but I would definitely love to. Oh man, be amazing! I'd love to. Yeah. And you use your sound sound design, ear and eye in your use of harmony as well, too? I try. Yeah, yeah I, I definitely try. I can hear it. And it's, yeah. It's, it's incredible. It makes the, it sound the most, new. Thanks. Mm. The most specific example I can give is that there's a Billy song called I Love You. Mm -hmm. And there, the second verse, the lyric is, up all night on another red eye. I wish we never learned to fly. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of, it's spaced. It's a long, that short verse is like, long held notes. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of sort of time. And uh, I was like, oh, it'd be cool to sort of, we're just on playing so much and I'm always recording. And I was like, it'd be great to use like the way it sounds when you're sitting in your seat on the plane, especially mm -hmm. if you're in coach, which mm -hmm. before like a month ago, I only have <laughs> ever been, you know, I've flown first class like six times in my life. Um, but when you're just right in there, yeah. there's just people everywhere, and yeah. people are putting in stuff in the overhead. So I have some sounds of that. And I have the sounds of the like, you know, there's a slide on the, in case of a waterland, like that voice. <laughs> and then I was like, what's that sound? Because I wasn't on a plane and I was doing the production. I was like, what's that sound of like the flight attendant call, like mm -hmm. bloom, bloom, mm -hmm. that thing? Mm -hmm. And I found it in like a recording I had. And it was in the, it was in C major. It was just two notes and like, it was like a triad in C. And I was like, well, that's great because I'm in, I'm making this song in C and it's an ambient noise, but it's really pretty and tonal. And then I was like, oh, and then it shifts to an F chord and then it shifts to like an A minor. And I was like, I bet I could alter that. So it starts as its original sound and then the notes actually change, which I used like Little Alter Boy or mm -hmm. Sound Shifter by Waves. Mm -hmm. But just like things like that, where to me it's like, Anything where I can take the work out of like making a decision for no reason mm -hmm. makes me feel really excited. Anything that it feels like intentional production of like, I'm doing this because of that. Like, you know, when sometimes people go like, why'd you do that? And you go like, do you like it? <laughs> You're like, right. You have no right. justification. You yeah. just have to go like, I think it sounds cool, yeah. which sometimes is all the justification you need. Yeah, absolutely. But anytime you can really, you know, put your, your, yeah. um, foot down on something and go like, I'm doing this because of this. It gives you this kind of like, I chose this path because, because it's this path. X. Is yeah. that where the crickets came from? Yeah, well the crickets, <laughs> so there's uh, my song Hollywood Forever, I was recording in my bedroom at home and I had the window open because it was really hot and mm -hmm. the house we grew up in had no central air. Mm -hmm. And there's just a lot of crickets outside. Why and so I, use them? I recorded some room tone. I was like, well, this is great. I was like, I'm not gonna get the whole vocal tonight, mm -hmm. but these crickets go. sound great. Yeah. This will make a oh, glance. Well, and the only other thing I was going to say about crickets was the song "When the Party's Over," which is a Billy track, mm -hmm. is just probably like 
150 layers of vocals because there's there's like low hums and middle hums and high hums and ahs and oohs and stacked harmonies and moments where they all swell. Mm. And that's kind of our, our vibe. So it was fun to do, but it took us forever. It took us like several weeks of like working a couple days a week to get all the parts. And there's really low parts and high parts. So there'd be days where she's like, I've got the high part today. I don't know if I got the low part today. Wow. The cool part is now when she does it live, she can do it all because wow. she's gotten yeah. better. But mm -hmm. at the time she was like, there'll be a day. And there's the bridge, the day we were recording the bridge, we got all of the vocals for the bridge on one day and it was a crickety day. There was just a lot of crickets. <laughs> it was a crickety day. I remember in the 80s when every night, early 90s when Babyface was putting crickets and everything. <laughs> Uh, I actually didn't. But yeah, baby we, face put crickets. We, and stuff? we had a cricket sound that that we all all us mixers had, and we would we would get asked to add the cricket sound to baby from about, stuff. Yeah, from 1990 to about 93. That's so funny. Back before electricity, it was <laughs> it, it, it was the weirdest thing. Black and white it, TV. They had crickets in every and everything. Song. I I I gotta be careful and not put them in everything because they really make a song feel alive immediately. Mm -hmm. If you take a song with no crickets, and especially if it's like MIDI <laughs> instruments, and then you add some crickets, you're like, wow, this song feels real. I was complaining driving over here. I was had the radio on, and there was just too many non-crickety songs. Yeah, so like, that's what's wrong with my... Make a note of that, please, guys. Yeah, that your last... More crickets. You did, more, more, more Grasshoppers crickets. work? Grasshoppers are cool, too. Yeah. Because we grew I think up on one, those. One cricket sounds a little bit like, you know, bad joke. Right. But... You have to commit. Crickets. You got to commit to yeah. crickets. Crickets. I have, there's a song of mine called Let's Fall in Love for the Night. And I was in um, um, a villa beach up by like San Luis Obispo, mm -hmm. Big Sur. Mm -hmm. Frogs. Bunch of frogs in mm -hmm. that song. Mm -hmm. Really like croaky. Just, but it sounds like the nighttime. It's yeah, great. Bet. Absolutely. Our conversation continues next week with producer, songwriter extraordinaire, Phineas. Phineas.